we often come together to share the bad news. And I will give that, of course, because that's part of my job. But there is a lot of good news. And I think Stand With Us is part of that good news. I came here tonight despite the pressure because I wanted to thank Avi and, Avi and the, all the members of Stand With Us who are there every time when we call a rally, when we have an, uh, a meeting, when we have uh, planning sessions. They're always there and are always participating. The campus today is a front line in the battle for the future, not just of the state of Israel, but of Israel and the Jewish people that you have to understand that the battle of BDS, the campaign of delegitimization, only targets Israel as the corporate entity representing the Jewish people. It's the collective Jew. It is all of us. And if you listen carefully to what they say, they're not talking about the destruction of Israel. Of course, that's one of the conditions, but they're talking about the elimination of the Jewish people. And the problem is, that dictators have always throughout history told us what they were going to do, we just don't take him seriously. Khamenei tells us every day what he's going to do, why he wants that bomb. And no matter what negotiations go on, they are moving ahead every day. He got what he wanted on November 25th. He got more time, four months, seven months, who knows how long, but he's already had almost 20 years Ten years they negotiated. Everybody forgets this is not six months in negotiation. And during that time, they developed the Iraq nuclear reactor, the plutonium reactor, 19,000 centrifuges in place. We have moved from dismantling the nuclear program to containing the nuclear program because people don't take him seriously. You know who does? His neighbors. They get it. They know what he means. And that's why more of them are turning to Israel. I was in Saudi Arabia, in the Gulf, in Egypt, three times in the last year. You have to hear how they talk about Israel today. The new recognition on their part about the importance of Israel as a stabilizing factor. And yet we see all of those here, here in our own country that a John Jay College of Criminal Injustice could allow the kind of debate to take place and leaving students vulnerable to see faculty across the country, to see university administrations not willing to stand up to this kind of bigotry and hatred that is also anti-Semitism. But they would not tolerate that bigotry and hatred against any other group. They wouldn't allow the kind of demonstrations by the so-called SJP. They wouldn't allow the kind of interference with speakers coming from Israel were they to be targeting any other group. And so it's us, we, who have to stand up to stand with us and stand with us to counter this because all of us will be held to account. All of us will be judged in the future. We look back and judge a generation of 70 years ago and ask what did they do? Our grandchildren, your grandchildren, and their grandchildren will ask what did you do? Because the decisions being made today are not about years or decades, they're about generations. That it's the future of the Jewish people and of the Jewish state. This is not about 67 occupations, settlements. It's about 47. It's about the creation of a Jewish state, the right of Jews to have a national expression, the right of Jews to defend themselves through the vehicle of a Jewish state defending its citizens. You know, the Geneva Convention is going to be convened now in the next days, for the third time since 1949 when it was adopted. The other two times, you know what they dealt with? Oh no, not the hundreds of thousands of deaths in Syria, not the murders of tens of thousands of Christians, not the massacres that take place in Iran, not the violations of human rights in Africa. Both of them dealt with Israel. And surprise, surprise, the one being convened this week with all of the terrible killings and murders that are taking place, deals again with Israel. This obsession, this is not a caring about human rights because it is a legitimate way for them to attack the Jewish state. They don't have to worry about being called anti-Semites or discriminating. We're doing it in the guise of supporting human rights. 
They haven't identified what human rights. What's the one country in the Middle East where human rights are defended, where a Christian community has grown in the last 20 years and not been decimated, where they have a right to run for office and be elected, where Arabs have a right to participate fully in a political process. And yet that's the one country singled out to have its credentials challenged at the United Nations because it is the collective Jew. So the work that is done by Stand With Us, by all the members of the Iran, the task force, the one on Iran, the one on BDS and delegitimization, because it's only through a united effort. It's only when all of us come together, when we can bring all the resources together and stop the infighting and stop the haranguing of one another, which is a waste of our energy and our resources, but coming together in a collective effort because all of us will share the same fate just as we share the same fate. All of us will pay the price. It's not gonna be the left or the right or the center or anybody else. When we're fighting now, it's for the future of the young people, the members of the Jewish community, and in fact for all, because Jews may be first, but we're never last. And it is imperative for us to help communicate that message now. And I see it more and more. The reports we get every day from campuses across the United States, from Wellesley, Harvard, Emory, physical assaults on Jews. When Frank Luntz had the group of AEPI students, leaders from across the country, more than 100 of them, and before he started his session on Israel, he asked them, by chance, how many of you have experienced personally anti-Semitism? And he told me he expected two, three people to raise their hand. And those of you who have seen it on the internet, every single hand went up. And he was taken aback. And he started interviewing them and asking them. And they started detailing how they were physically assaulted. One guy was three weeks in the hospital. And how they were subjected when they undertook pro-Israel activities to harassment, even by sometimes the university administrations, let alone by other students. So this is a critical time. I know people don't want to hear it. And people say, you know, it's bad news. It's, you know what, the only bad news is ignorance. It's not knowing. It's not being well, willing to stand up. It's not understanding the kind of challenges that we face. Iran is the first challenge, but Iran is directly related to the BDS campaign. And we know that there's foreign funding coming into the BDS and delegitimization campaign. Read what Khomeini says. Look how he attacks Israel. But you know, in every sentence, he first attacks the Crusaders which is America and Christians. So the battle for Israel is the battle for America. It's a battle for truth and justice for everybody. And we have to communicate and tell the American people what the real stake here is. So that when we get young people like those in stand with us who are so articulate and can make the case, it's sometimes more effective than some of us. You know, six years ago, I was also entering high school <laughs> to, to visit my grandchildren. <laughs> so we are, the next gen, see the next generation rising. And I will tell you, for those who don't get it yet about Iran, Iran is not a local danger. It's a global danger. It's not only the biggest sponsor of global terrorism. It's not only behind Hamas and now has re reconciled, with, reconciled with Hamas, but also behind Hezbollah. And Hezbollah operates in more than 30 countries. It's behind activities here in the United States, just illicit cigarettes, and that's them a billion dollars a year for Hezbollah in North America. They're here, it's now. This is a battle that Zudi Jasser has courageously led to get people to understand the true nature, and he will speak about it, I won't. But to understand how he puts his life at risk doing it. This is America. Who thought that these kind of things could happen? Iran boasted that they've taken, for the first time, Shiites have the control of four Arab capitals, Yemen, Lebanon, Syria, and Iraq. And I will tell you now, there will be a fifth, and that's the Sudan, which will be a base of operations in Africa, against Gaza, against, in Sinai, against Libya, and against the government of Egypt. They're not sitting on their hands during this period. They're diddling our negotiators. They think they can take on guys who have been bazaaris for 2,000 years and they're going to out-negotiate them. The stakes are very high. And so we have to, all of us, do our part. Not everybody can do everything, but everybody can do something. We can foster unity in our community, reach out to each other, 
reach out to the kids on campus, give them the comfort and support that they need, make sure their voices are heard and that they hear our voices, make sure that the administrations and alumni and all are mobilized, that they know they're going to pay a price for the kind of activities that we have seen tolerated for far too long. And I honestly believe that if we, in fact, are a generation that has learned the lessons of the past and understands our responsibilities to the future, if we stand up in this time and speak out, and speak out forcefully on every occasion, no more tolerance, zero tolerance for intolerance against Jews, against Israel, no more forgiveness, no more excuses, and no matter who it comes from, from the highest levels of officialdom to the lowest levels on the streets, that we will stand up and defend our rights and our right to speak, and that we will assure the students and future generations a bright and safe future. Thank you so much, Malcolm. Dr. Zudi Jasser is the founder of the American Islamic Forum for Democracy, AIFD. A devout Muslim, Dr. Jasser founded AIFD in the wake of the 9-11 attacks as an effort to provide American Muslim voice for advocating for the preservation of the founding principles of the United States Constitution through the separation of mosque and state. Dr. Jasser is a first-generation American Muslim whose parents fled the oppressive Ba'ath regime of Syria in the mid-1960s. He is leading the fight against the Muslim Brotherhood and their network of American Islamist organizations and mosques in America. AIFD seeks to counter political Islam the ideology that, fuel, that fuels radical Islamists. AFD's current projects include Muslim Liberty Project that seeks to instill the ideas of liberty into young Muslim adults in order to inoculate them against the viral threat of political Islam. Dr. Jasser is also actively involved in the Syrian American community as the co-founder of Save Syria Now, which was formed by Americans of Syrian descent to put pressure on the United States to call for immediate action to end the regime of Bashar Assad of Syria. Dr. Jasser regularly briefs members of the House and Senate Congressional Anti-Terror Caucuses on the threat of political Islam. I'm humbled by being able to speak for Stand With Us and speak to all of you. I know many of you in the audience, uh, you're becoming like family for, for me and, and for us. And I know when I was in San Diego, I spoke to Roz uh, Rothstein and uh, when she was introducing uh, some of the same uh, issues and the good work of uh, Stand With Us, she said, you know, one of the core, I think, things that makes Stand With Us stand out is that they partner with organizations that are different than them, that share so many common values and so many of the missions that you do. And I think that's what's so unique about our relationship, is that Israel, that small, tiny country in the Middle East, that only democracy that is functioning and exists and shares our values, cannot exist if it only shares with organizations that are the same. It's working with organizations that are different, that share that mission, that make us all succeed. And I want to thank Avi, I want to thank Eric and, and your entire team. I know what it takes to put together a, a, a function like this, so God bless you and, and thank you for having me here. I hope today I can share with you some of my story and what makes me who I am, and you can realize that uh, while I might be sometimes a voice in the wilderness, and it might be appearing that I'm rare, but I hope we can have some hope, too, and that ultimately to tell you that from the time in 2006 when Malcolm's organization and the Conference of Presidents took me to Israel, that we were just starting, we were a small organization, that there were seven of us Muslims that went on that trip to Israel, and we realized in my first time going to Israel that it is and as, as my colleague said, as humbling as it is to say, it's a normal country. It's a democracy. It's like the West. Despite all the propaganda and all the, what is the new anti-Semitism, the anti-Israel movement, uh, try to portray and propagandize, the reality is, for those of us that have visited, is that it is not only a normal country, it's our greatest ally in the Middle East and in the world. And I think the... The key to our future is understanding, you know, I do this as a doctor. I, I came to this as a physician, and I often get told, well, what is your qualifications to do this work? And I, I can tell you that I do this as an American. 
And if the regular Muslim community, the intellectual Muslim community that understands our faith, understands America, and can diagnose the problem, if we don't treat it, it'll never get solved. This is a Muslim problem that needs a Muslim solution. And, and we can't do this by ourselves. And if we, as a country, as Americans, and as people who believe in countries like Israel, if we don't get the diagnosis right, you can't get the treatment right. And as any of you who are physicians out there, you know that if you just treat symptoms, you will kill your patients. You can't just treat symptoms. Certainly we don't want our patients to suffer, but we don't just take away the cough and the headache and the pain and the symptoms. We treat the disease. We treat the infection. We treat the diagnosis, the cancer itself. As we now just recently saw the 73rd anniversary of Pearl Harbor, I'll tell you that we're in the same time today. I, I shudder to think my three kids, who are 12, 10, and 6, are now all post-9-11 children. And they look at 9-11 as something in the history books that is something they just see pictures of. And I try to tell them that, and I hope all our youth understand that this is the not the, fir the first salvo was probably the hostage crisis of 79, but this is the, the largest attack on our soil since Pearl Harbor, and that ultimately this was a military salvo of an ideological battle, and that ultimately this battle, even to call it a battle against the West, the West is collateral damage in what is an internal civil war within the House of Islam. Israel is collateral damage. Anti-Semitism is used as a tool to unite the Muslims in an Islamist movement. So if we don't get this diagnosis right, you're going to continue to participate in the treatment of symptoms. Terrorism is a symptom. Anti-Semitism within the Muslim community is a symptom. The diagnosis is Islamist supremacism the belief in the Islamic State, any Islamic State, not just ISIS, not just Iran, any Islamic State is a theocracy. There is no democratic Islamic State. They might come to power through elections. As we know, the Nazis, the Hamas came to power through elections. Democracy is not elections. And this is where we've been getting, among the many things we've been getting wrong, in our foreign policy. Yes, I was elated to see the purple finger in Iraq, and I love that image because it was a sign of Saddam Hussein leaving, but it wasn't a sign of democracy. As we can see, they, they do very poorly without adult supervision in Iraq. <laughs> and the reason they do poorly is two generations of dictatorship, vicious dictatorship, breeds a corrupt, immoral, population that only survives because of a Darwinian policy. And this is actually our new foreign policy. You know, I'm trying to figure out what the doctrine is. You know, we knew Bush doctrine was about the freedom agenda. And I, I agreed with President Bush that ultimately every individual left to their own devices wants to be free. But that was a good beginning, but there was no follow through with that entire policy because the policy really can't just be about turning on Jeffersonian democracy like lights. It's, it has to be a process of education, of institution building, civil society building. It's not something that can be won militarily. And the difference between Iraq and Syria, which were both Ba'athist regimes, Iraq was not an indigenous revolution. So we basically broke it from a, from a system that at that time was not ready to be broken. Syria is very different. It's a system that broke itself and you have a revolution of the majority of Syrians that are fighting against their regime. And ultimately, as I've testified to Congress back before Al-Qaeda was in Syria, they will be more and more radicalized as they don't have the infusion of the treatment of that disease. And that disease has two sides of the same coin. Make no mistake, the fascism of political Islam, which we see in power in Iran, we saw in power in Egypt, we see with Hamas and all the Islamist movements, is just on the other side of the coin of Arab fascism or Arabism. You know, make no mistake that, yes, the Arab dictators are possibly less of a threat than the Islamist fascists, but they're still a threat. They have not abandoned Islamism. They just want to control 
the way it's implemented. The Egyptian government just last week outlawed political Islam. The UAE listed a huge number of Muslim Brotherhood related groups, including a few American groups like the Council on American Islamic Relations and the Muslim American Society. Groups we've always known are Muslim Brotherhood legacy groups. And I think if anything, it should be educational to the West that when you have royal families in the Middle East, governments calling them brotherhood and wanting to outlaw their interactions with their citizens, hopefully a light will go on in Washington that, wow, maybe these organizations are swimming in the same pool as Hamas. Maybe there's a reason they won't condemn Hamas because they are floating and swimming in the same pool. Now that doesn't mean that I think care should be outlawed. You can't defeat good, bad ideas with good ideas if you push them underground and make them illegal. We defeated the communists and the Nazis without making those parties illegal in America. What we do want to make illegal is the direct financing of terrorism, uh, hate speech, I'm sorry, speech that directly incites violence, calls for violence. That Brandenbury versus Ohio said clearly that that should be illegal in the case about the KKK. But it never said the KKK as a party should be outlawed because that's what the Arab dictators do. That's what they do to feed radicalization because underground, the AKP came to party, came to power in Turkey because they were pushed underground for so long. One year of the Muslim Brotherhood running the government in Egypt did more to destroy the ideas of political Islam. You had five times more people in the streets in Revolution 2.0 in Egypt after one year of the party running Egypt than you did in 60 years from Nasser Sadat and Mubarak because they were victims for 60 years. They were in prison. They were hung in the streets. They were, they were uh, uh, martyred, which is their doctrine. Lost in that debate between the Arab fascists and the Islamist fascists are the majority of Muslims and Christians and others in those societies who are trying to find, now I can't tell you they found liberalism, but I believe left to their own devices with information coming in, they will find liberalism as the West did. But there hasn't been an open infusion of ideas. Where in America, for example, is radical Islam growing the fastest? Has it been in the last 50 years? In prisons. And why is that? The information going into the prison is the imams who believe in jihadist ideology for the most part, as groups like Stephen Emerson and others have so well outlined and detailed for us because the government doesn't pay attention. And there's no other information coming in. So the people going out form cells when they leave, which are terror cells. Surprise, surprise. That's not a surprise. So Syria was a prison for 50 years. There was no information coming in other than what the Ba'athists wanted to come into that country. Egypt was a prison. Iraq under Saddam Hussein was a prison. So you can't reform the ideas that we as Muslims have such hard and deep work to do in reforming and modernizing against Sharia and government, against the Islamic State, against the Caliphate, against Jihad as a concept we need to defeat entirely, against apostasy laws, against blasphemy laws that restrict free speech for women's rights and equality. And what happens is in America, the Muslim organizations speaking on behalf of my faith are duping America into believing that the problem is terrorism and that's why we have these policies about countering violent extremism and that really we just need to combat the militancy component. And you saw there's a letter recently to Baghdadi. You can go to lettertobaghdadi.com and you find 150 imams and leaders of Muslim organizations that signed it. I've had conservatives give me that letter and say, look, Zudi, why, aren't you, why haven't you signed this? This is a very moderate document. They condemn the violence of ISIS and it seems to be a step forward. I'll tell them this list is a good list to tell you who the Muslim Brotherhood is in the West. The Brotherhood is very upset with Al-Qaeda and with ISIS because they're outing their, they're outing their real ideology. So that letter is 25 pages of what is the Islamic legitimate way to do a caliphate? You should do it democratically through elections. What is the legitimate jihad? They have three pages of how a jihad can only be called by scholars, ulama of Islam, and that those ulama have to do it by consensus and, and vote, and then they can give the people their right. The, there's only two paragraphs in that 25 pages about the women's rights that Baghdadi and ISIS have offended, and they condemn the slavery and all the other things that every human being would condemn, but they never use the word equality. They never use the words 
of Western feminism, of universal human rights. And this is where the battle is. Actually, I believe the moderate Islamists, and moderate meaning nonviolent, are more dangerous because no Muslims are. Actually, there was a piece in the New York Times a few days ago that said Muslims are leaving Islam in droves when they, try, when they find that Islam is ISIS. So ISIS is not a threat. And I don't want Muslims to leave my faith. I'm raising my kids to be faithful, devout Muslims. But the bigger threat to Islam and to the world, when you're talking about a constituency that has a quarter of the world's population, is the supremacism of the Islamic State, which is, gets its inspiration from the fact that the document, the constitution of that state should not be man-made, like our wonderful constitution, but rather the Quran and the clerics that interpret it. What is our biggest asset is often our biggest liability. Our biggest asset in the West is the belief in individual rights, the fact that why should you have four synagogues when you can have eight, right? Why? And I tell Muslims that we need to divide. We need to, you know, if you don't like the group you're with, create a new one, because that's what America is. It's about individual rights. You want to, even if it's five people, create that group so that you're happy and you agree with them. That's unity. That's independence. That's freedom. You, you, by preserving individual rights, you preserve the community, you preserve the nation by, in, by feeding that creativity. And there's so many Muslim scholars that taught me that. Now, it's our liability because in these countries when they have elections, the Islamists unite in a collective mandate as the Khomeinis do in the Shia tradition, as the Sunni Islamists do in, in the Muslim Brotherhood. They unite and they're winning elections because all the other Muslims divide into 50, 60 different parties as we saw in Tunisia, in Egypt, etc. And then they're left with the old Arab fascists against the Islamists and you have the same two sides of that coin. So ultimately, the biggest struggle I've had is how do we unite those who believe in liberalism? And how did that happen in the West? And I think we're not, you know, I don't think that the struggle for all of you is to try to get your head around which Islamic theology is the right one. I think your allies, the, the old mantra of our, our, the enemy of our enemy is our friend, I think has proven not to be the right answer. The Assads of this world want their populations to be radicalized. It took America to bomb ISIS. Syria, Assad could have bombed ISIS when they first started, but oh, conveniently he didn't. He was bombing our families in Aleppo and Damascus who were the moderates that would have overthrown him. Meanwhile, our administration here was many ways ridiculing those rebels, saying that, oh, they're doctors and pharmacists and engineers, they don't know how to fight. Well, that's true, but that's what America was founded on, was lay people that weren't warriors that decided to get the right to bear arms and fight against the theocrats or the fascists. And even when the West was reformed, it went back to fascism, left to its own devices, as we saw in Germany and Italy and, and uh, in Japan on the other side of the world. So fascism will never go away. It will keep coming back. And as Reagan has said, it only needs one generation to disappear for freedom to disappear. And this is a bipartisan or nonpartisan battle. As we form allies, our American Islamic Forum for Democracy, which has a simple mission statement we formed in 2003. And it's interesting now people since ISIS are starting to figure out what our mission, why our mission statement makes sense. It was the preservation of the U.S. Constitution and liberty through the separation of mosque and state. We, nine families in Arizona, sat together, wrote that mission statement, and then wrote 17 different principles that we insist that Muslims who sign on believe in that. It includes the equality of women, the right of every Muslim to interpret our own Arabic scripture, the uh, um, importance of liberty, and the, and the importance of the support of the American military. And one of those principles is the, the importance of supporting and believing in the state of Israel. And I'll tell you, <laughs> thank you. And I'm embarrassed that we have to include that in there. You know, what's the relevance of the state of Israel to Islamic reform and modernization? Well, the relevance is it is a red flag. It is a litmus test for those Muslims, especially, that believe in Western society because the collectivization of Muslims is done by demonizing the other faiths. As Mr. Honlein said, 
it is not just about Israel. They condemn the Crusaders. They condemn the West. They use the West as a foil to propagate their own Islamism. And then they anesthetize their populations that Islam is the only solution. Well, it's maybe their Islam, but not my Islam. Now, if we get the diagnosis wrong, and this is why it's a nonpartisan issue, we have two extremes in America. One extreme that says that no Muslim could ever do wrong. It's not Islamic. It's, they're trying to basically, you know, our, our president at times sounds like the excommunicator in chief by telling me who's Muslim and who's not. So it's not an Islamic thing, it's not Muslims. It's just terrorism and criminality. And the other extreme, which is every Muslim could be lying to you, every Muslim's a potential terrorist, we need to close down this country from immigration of Muslims, and we're becoming more isolationist in many ways. Both extremes are wrong. In the middle are 90% of Americans who are confused, well, what should be our strategy? And we need a vision, we need a strategy. Without a vision like we had in the Cold War, you know, I read Natan Sharansky's book who had a big impact on me and, and he said that he knew he would be free from the prisons in the Soviet Union when he heard President Reagan call the Soviets the evil empire. And I can tell you, for every minority, every woman that's in jail, every Yazidi, Baha'i, Jew, Christian that is in jail and persecuted in Muslim countries, there are 10 times more Sunni Muslims that believe in liberty that are in jail. And until our leadership, both parties, President Bush never identified Islamism as a problem. Karen Hughes was a, I'm sorry, a, a disaster as far as engaging political Islam. She basically was doing public diplomacy that terrorism were working with the non-terrorist. We need to have the courage to go back to the roots of America, which was to engage religion, which is what our founding fathers do, and engage those that believe in liberty and unite those movements against theocracy. That is the narrative. And it's amazing to me that in today's climate, even the king of Bahrain, one of the princes of Bahrain just yesterday, said that we are not fighting terrorists, we are fighting theocrats. He said military, social, po political, economic, we need to put all these walls against the theocrats. And I'm saying, wow, these guys are saying the same thing I am. Now the difference, the Bahraini, the Al Khalifa family in Bahrain are never going, the words he didn't use is liberty. The word he didn't use is Islamism. Because they still have an Islamic state with their inspiration from the Quran as they're supposedly the, should be the laws of their country in Sharia. But only the royal family's definition of that because the biggest threat to oligarchical Islamists are populist Islamists of the, of the majority. So yeah, they're going to declare the Brotherhood a terror group. But they're not going to look at the solution, which is liberty, which will put them out of business too. And that's where the West has to wake up. 70% of the world lives under oppression and has no religious freedom. So take away China and Russia, you're left with Muslim-majority countries. And, you know, right now our, our homeland security domestic policy is a whack-a-mole program, program. Our foreign policy is a whack-a-mole program. We go from Iran to Afghanistan to Nigeria with Boko Haram. These are all not different diagnoses. It's all the same. You know what Boko Haram means in the Nigerian language? What is that? It, it means Western education is a sin. That's what it means. So how is Boko Haram any different than Hamas, which Palestinian media demonizes Western society and has all these conspiracy theories that they brainwash? We have been missing in action in the ideological battle, not only just to be humbly defensive that America doesn't do bad, like we're doing now with this report that, again, from a partisan standpoint this week, has been released to make partisan points. All the while, you know, uh, I was on Hannity earlier, you might be able to see it later tonight, and I said, what are we supposed to do, give them shy and Arabic coffee when we have a terrorist that we've captured and we're trying to figure out where the next act, next act is gonna happen? <laughs> And I'm not saying we shouldn't release reports. That's what's the amazing about democracy is that we air our information publicly to discuss it, but not half-baked. This report was half-baked. It was released by one party without even the CIA directors or others discussing it. Now you go to the Iranian media on the front page of their media, Egyptian media and others, America tortures its prisoners. This is what happens in America. 
and then you wonder why we're losing the hearts and minds. I'm ready to have that debate if we release a true, if it's the truth. But if it's done for partisan politics, which is what's destroying our strategy, we should be able to unite that in order to save the free world, we have to figure out who our enemy is. And no one's willing to identify that right now on either party. Brad Sherman said this a few weeks ago in the House. He said, the US needs to combat the Islamic State, not just militarily, but ideologically. He said, we have the outreach, we don't have the research. The State Department has thousands of lawyers. I think they ought to hire one or two experts in Islamic jurisprudence, whether they be practicing Muslims or others who have the expertise. He said, it's not enough to look at what ISIS did. They beheaded somebody, it's evil. The jihadis had to be refuted on Islamic grounds. One must be able to turn to the Quran, to turn to the Hadith, and show how ISIS is making a mockery of a great world religion. But you cannot appeal to Islamic jurists, Muslims, unless you can cite Hadith, unless you can cite Quran, unless you can do all these things you would be doing and working before any other jurist anywhere in the world. So, and I cite Brad Sherman because he's a Democrat. This is not only a conservative issue or democratic issue. Many of the organizations we work with are feminist organizations in the Muslim world and in America, gay rights organizations, civil rights organizations. We should be holding hands together to figure out where all the different circles we work in overlap. And it's about liberal values. And at the core is a battle between, you know, what makes the pull for Muslims to go join ISIS, I can tell you is tens to hundreds of times greater than it was for them to join Al-Qaeda in 2002. And we ended up having Nidal Hassan influenced by Imam Awlaki, who was an American. Not only was Nidal Hassan radicalized in the military, and if you look at his resume, it's very similar to my resume, military trained, doctor, etc. But yet we turned out 180 degrees different. His, his mentor was American born. Awlaki was born here, and we had to kill him in a strike in Yemen after he left a mosque in Northern Virginia. Now, was he, was he advocating violence in Northern Virginia? Likely not, maybe he was, I don't know. But the bottom line is, is his ideology was anti-American and anti-Western and anti-Israel. All three go together. And we need to counter that, not only by apologizing for the West, which doesn't, doesn't work, we do that by being pro-American. Our Muslim Liberty Project teaches Muslims to be pro-American and pro-liberty, and by necessity that makes them anti-Islamist. You can't be pro-Islamist and pro-American. It doesn't work. Because the social contract in America, in our Constitution, is based on the fact that every human being, Muslim, Christian, Jewish, atheist, could become president. Every individual could become a congressman or woman or a senator or a, a leader. In an Islamic state, not possible. The president has to be Muslim. They have to understand Sharia law. That is not a democracy. And on and on, I can give you sessions on how we teach our kids about why the Islamic state is against freedom. And our, this is not a new battle. Thomas Paine had the same battle when he was fighting against the theocrats. And he said the worst tyranny of all is the tyranny of religion. And this is where we are, the lens that I want you to look through this conflict. Israel has been a canary in the coal mine in dealing with radical Islam for over 60 years now since its inception. And it will continue to do so because the neighborhood in which it's living is fueling that. The dictators continue to fuel radical Islam and then say, oh, we're victims of it, please help us, while they fuel it. The Egyptian dictatorships have shown the protocols every year on television while they said they were pro-Israel and not at war with Israel while they demonized Jews. So this is part of their playbook. And Islamopatriism, and this is why I do this, I don't do this work, and in my book, A Battle for the Soul of Islam, I talk about how I turned out the way I am and why I do this. It's really as much as I love my faith and God is a central part of all of my life, I do this because, not for my faith, God will determine what happens to us and our faith in the future. I do this for American security and the protection of free countries like Israel.
unless we have a strategy, unless we come together as people of conscience, there will not be an America, there will not be free Europe, there will not be an Israel for our children to be free in. We have to stop the whack-a-mole program. And I want to leave you with a quotation from a philosopher, an existential philosopher, who wrote a book called Islam Without Submission. Marian Bidar, a French philosopher in Paris, wrote, Oh, my dear Muslim world, I hear the cry of rebellion rising within you, and I understand it. Yes, you're right. Like every one of the great sacred inspirations of the world, Islam has, throughout its history, created beauty, justice, meaning, and good. And it has been a source of powerful enlightenment for humans who are on the path through the mystery of existence. Here in the West, I fight in all my books so that this wisdom of Islam and all religions is not forgotten or despised. But because of my distance from the Muslim world, I can see that which you cannot. And this inspires me to ask you, why has this monster stolen your face? Why has this despicable monster chosen your face and not any other? The truth is that behind this monster hides a huge problem, one you do not seem ready to confront. Yet in the end, you will have to find the courage to do so. The root of this evil that today steals your faith is within yourself. The monster emerged from your own belly. And other monsters, some even worse, will emerge again and again as long as you refuse to acknowledge your sickness and to finally tackle the root of this evil. Israel confronts this every day. But I think what has made Israel successful, it has never succumbed to the belief that there's a new normal. When two weeks ago, four rabbis were killed in a, in a, in a synagogue. It was not a new normal. One of those rabbis is a scholar of Maimonides, who was one of the historical Jewish scholars that studied while living in an Islamic majority society. This not only is heartbreaking, but the, is, the Israeli community never takes that as a new normal, and that's why it still exists today. America, I fear, is beginning to take these acts in Oklahoma, in Ottawa, in London, in Boston, in Fort Hood as a new normal. That, oh, okay, let's just go on two days, it blips, and then we forget about sort of a strategy, when these are all symptoms of a much bigger problem. I was a doc in the Navy for 11 years, and I took care of a number of, uh, of our armed services folks serving our country, and I got to know some of the SEALs. And they have a motto in the SEALs, which is that if you take each one of them, it's like a twig, you can break it and they'll vanish. But you take them all together, 10, 20 twigs, and you wrap a little rope around it, it becomes very hard to break those twigs. And the SEALs survive with that sense of unity. America survives because we all know we have equal rights before this law in America. The free world will not survive unless we unite together in values of liberty to preserve countries like America and Israel for our children. Thank you. Thanks. Um, this is, uh, I think, the third time I've had the pleasure, and we hosted Zudi Jasser this summer, I think it was, on Long Island. And I asked you a question at the time. I read your book. I raved about your book, um, Struggle for the Soul of Islam, and your organization. But to bring up a point, at that time, I said, how many clerics have you in your organization? And you didn't have any clerics. So can we address that a little bit and what your game plan is? Yeah, I, I, that's a great question. And, and really, the imams, if there happens to be an imam that comes our way that wants to work with us, that's great. But it's not in our early business plan, I would tell you, over the next five years. Um, it's in the long-term plan over 10 to 20 years. But, you know, again, I would tell you in, in our founding fathers, it wasn't the priests that ended up defeating the church. It was the religious lay community that fought against them. Thomas Jefferson, Thomas Paine, Madison, they were not clerics. Uh, so as much as there are reformers like, you know, uh, Abdullah Naim in Emory, uh, Muhammad al uh President Wahid from Indonesia, uh, there are many imams that have taught, that have written books that we give to our kids in our Muslim Liberty Project. But this issue, as I read, the, even the monarchs are threatened by populist Islamism. So the campaign that we need to start with is to wake up the, the mosque going great of Muslims in America is 12%, is 10 to 20%. 12% of Muslims identify with the Council on American-Islamic Relations. 8% identify with ISNA. 
the Islamic Society of North America. And ISNA, by the way, has larger conventions, has conventions of 50 to 60,000 people. But the majority of Muslims in America reject both of those. So my biggest dilemma is not the, the clerics. It's waking up and getting the fire under the feet of Muslims to join us, to help us. I've talked to many. The numbers are increasing that support me behind the scene. We're in the thousands now, three to four thousand, over four thousand now. But the ones that want to be public about it say it's not worth it, that's why we left the Middle East, and then there's no urgency. They say, oh, the Muslim Brotherhood's not going to take over America, why should we do this? In Egypt, they were coming to the streets to fight against the Brotherhood because they saw what they did when they took control of government. So I need your help to stop this narrative that it's not Islamic because as long as they think that the identity of their children as Muslims is not threatened by the Islamists, they're going to stay asleep. Once they feel a threat, which is what political correctness is preventing, they're going to start joining us and, and, and building that populist movement. So the first step is populist movement, then we will come to the clerics and the the true reform. You were speaking about the United States. Is there any hint that what you propose is uh, about uh, trying to liberalize uh, the Muslim community is happening elsewhere in the Arab world, for example? The, the hint is there's more examples of what we do in the Arab world. The problem is, is there's a guy by the name of uh, uh, Raif Bedawi. Um, who is in Saudi Arabia, he's now in jail, you know, wrote a, has an organization called Free Saudis. Um, many of our colleagues come in and out of jail um, and they have not been able to get platforms, which is why this work has to be done in America. It is done over there. There's a lot more examples of me over there because, the again, the stimulus is greater. One of the things that just popped in mind from both of your questions is when ISIS went through northern Iraq, after they left their home base in Raqqa and went to Iraq. You know who the first people they killed were? They killed 35 Imams in the first two weeks of them going into northern Iraq. So the first targets they kill are the theologians and many of the Imams that support us behind, behind the scenes know that, that they're going to be the first ones and, and that's why we have to be inspired by them but ultimately the ones doing the hard work of reform because both the dictators and the Islamists who are dictators don't want those reformists. Raif Bedoui was put in jail by the House of Saud, even though most of what he wrote was against the Wahhabis and, and the Islamist mentality. But the House of Saud was threatened by his popular liberalism, too. So there's a lot there. It's just they're not winning the revolutions right now. Shukran ala al-kalam al-hilwa. I want to ask you, uh, you as a devout Muslim, and I would believe that uh, you, th you consider the Quran as a holy book and hadith as a holy tradition. What can so, you say? What, okay, so what can you say about those passages that are clearly anti-Semitic and <coughs> anti-infidel? How do you deal with them? Thank you. And that, back again, these questions are all interconnected. We can't just sort of say, oh, we can't address these things, let the imams do it, because you can't have credibility within the Muslim community unless you address these things. And in my book, there's a whole chapter that addresses some of the controversial verses. So we can't dismiss them. I believe as a Muslim that every comma in the Quran is authentic and the word of God. So the Quran we have to deal with. The hadith, I will tell you, for example, Hamas's charter, kill a Jew behind every stone that's in there, that's not from Quran, that's so-called hadith. And my family and so many others don't believe that's legitimate hadith, that that was contrived by people to, to take control and, and fuse anti-Semitism. And I've signed petitions that that is not, we reject that passage as not being the, the words of the Prophet. Most hadith was written 70 years to 100 after his death, most actually two to 300 years. So its authenticity is, is easy if you do the science to refute. Quranic passages, especially chapter 5 and chapter 9, for example, one of, and I'll just give you one example and then you can go and look at some of the rest. Be careful to use Google translations because that's Wahhabi, that's petrodollar infused. They've been doing this campaign for 100 years to dominate the translations. Even the Fatiha ends as it says, you know, Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim to guide us and not to go astray, period. Astray, it doesn't end like the Jews and Christians. And yet if you look at most translations, it says in parentheses, like the Jews and Christians, even though in Arabic it doesn't say that. It says, it doesn't say Jews and Christians. 
So the other passage that says, do not take Jews and Christians as friends. How could first, for, and I, we talk to our kids about that, how could God tell us that we could marry a Jewish, have a, a Jewish mother to our children and yet not take them as friends? There's some disconnect there. The disconnect is not abrogation, as some would say. God abrogates the verses that he told us are abrogated, like drinking alcohol, he abrogated the previous verses. The word as friend is awliya. Awali, as you know in Arabic, doesn't mean friend, it means a legal sponsor in your religious court. So yes, even if you marry a Jew or a Christian, she could not, in a Sharia court, just like in a Jewish court, you would not have a Christian or a non-Jew be your witness in a Talmudic court. So that's what that's in reference to. It doesn't mean that you can't be friends. The Wahhabis interpret it as friends. Long story short, we have to reinterpret these things through a modern lens, and it can be done. Okay. So my question is, how can I as a Jew and other Jews here, how can we help your organization and what credibility would we have with the Islamic community? Um, how we help one another is a couple things. One is to create opportunities and platforms in media to put Muslim, we have an American Islamic Leadership Coalition that includes 20, I can give you 20 different names, Tawfiq Hamid, Zainab al Sawaj. Um, Tariq Fatah, um, Lib for All, which is a larger organization that do all similar work. So when the media is asking for Muslims, stop putting care and isna alone. Put us up with them so you can see, like you saw in that clip, that Muslims are diverse. We're not monolithic and offended. So one is create platforms. Two is have policymakers begin to develop a strategy that includes the targeting of Islamism, of the Islamic State. And help, and as I read from Brad Sherman, we need to have those policymakers and people that identify Islamism because right now, I can tell you we don't have any security clearance uh, um, filters for Islamists in our government. And just like we had the Walkers and so many others that were working with the Soviets, we probably have 10 to 100 more times Islamists that are not filtered that are working with security clearances because we're not addressing that issue. So we need to work together to build platform, and then universities, another problem. That's why we work so closely with Stand With Us. You've got endowments from Georgetown through the Saudis, Harvard, et cetera, that are based and infused with petrodollars that won't address the issues I talked to you about today. Both? Both. Oh. Okay. Um, you, you, gave a, you gave us the diagnosis. You gave us the prescription to attack the radical theocrats. But I'm not hearing a lot of, I'm sorry, you gave us the diagno diagnosis and the prescription. But what I'm not hearing is a lot of confidence that the prescription will be taken. So I want to get a better sense, a little more clarity on, 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 on how confident you are. I mean, is this a lost cause even? You know? Well, if it was a lost cause, <laughs> that's a great question. I, I am a cup half full kind of guy. Um, I believe that... You know, if there's any community that should believe uh, that there's never a lost cause, it's what the Jewish community has been through. And I can tell you that if a quarter of the world, well, this is not a small constituency I'm talking about that Islamists feed off of. If a quarter of the world's population, if the recipe was bad and it was a lost cause, as Bernard Lewis writes in his book, What Went Wrong, the world would have perished a long time ago. So I have hope because... Most Muslims I talk to, Islam is a non-church type. It's, it's a non-hierarchical um, um, religion. We don't have communication. Contrary to the Islamists, we don't have communication or excommunication from a church. Though they try to apostate us, they can't. And ultimately... There's a fatwa on Oh, yeah, there's a fatwa on the mic. <laughs> <laughs> so, so they try to excommunicate us, but they can't. It's a very personal religion. That's why 85 to 90 percent of Muslims cannot go to mosque and still be very Muslim because my parents used to go to a different mosque every week sometimes because there's so many mosques. There's no congregational concept in Islam other than just going to prayers on Friday and the unity of the ummah. Now, ummah as nation state needs to be defeated. Ummah as community, it can be a very protean community. So I think I, you can be positive. I think Muslims respond to liberty conversations and logic when you confront them. Currently, yes, I am at the bottom of the mountain in a very uphill battle. 
Uh, history has shown that wars within religions are the bloodiest of wars. Uh, the West was not created through one simple revolution. France went through many. Uh, there were 30 years and the 100 years war that were very, very bloody revolutions. This is not going to be bloodless. The Iranian theocrats won't leave just sort of uh, easily. Uh, but there was a green revolution and ultimately I think we just need to be on the right side of history and freedom will win. I've been given the sign that I'm not allowed to ask any more questions. Everybody can boo Avi. Um, I want to thank you so much. Uh,